It is a pleasure to be with you today. Um, since I retired or started to retire, it was always Mary Jean's and my desire that we would be able to come and sit with our Lang family and worship on a Sabbath. And, you know, it just seemed like it never happened because we were always involved with various uh, ministries at, uh, in Eugene. And so I'm glad for the opportunity to be here today just to greet you all and to uh, be able to share that God is a good God. He's a wonderful heavenly father. And to be able to, in fellowship, be able to reiterate that together. So it's good to be here. We were able to be in the beginning portion of our uh, service in, in, in Eugene this morning. Um, Ron and Zelda brought Kevin with them to church, so I got a chance to speak with him just briefly this morning, and they appreciate our prayers in their behalf. I would also just share with you that we have two people in our congregation whose health is really failing quite rapidly. Brother Raymond Wallace um, is in hospice care and, um, <clears throat> and is not doing well at all. Uh, Vaughn and Harold Ogren were able to bring Joe to church this morning. It's been a while since he's been able to be there because of his failing health. And so I would just appreciate it if you would remember them in your prayers as well. <clears throat> this is going to be a different kind of sermon for me, perhaps a different kind of sermon for you as well. You know, since I retired, um, you know, I'm, I'm free from having sermon topics planned out for months and perhaps uh, years in advance. And, <clears throat> and so since I have retired and I don't speak on a regular basis, I don't have a plan. And so my plan today is just to kind of ramble and to share with you some things, little things in life. And, and, I, and I don't know where it's going to go. I think I know where it's going to end, uh, but in the process of everything, it's my desire that you will be lifted up and encouraged as well as to understand that God has a special place for you, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, to play a role in his kingdom. So I want to begin this morning by just reading a verse from 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11, where it says, Yours, O Lord is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted over all. I can't think of a better place to begin this morning to share because God is such a wonderful heavenly father. By the word of his mouth, created all things. And on Monday, I, I read this verse last week in my, in my devotional time, and I thought how wonderfully the, the sequence of the eclipse comes on Monday to remind us about how wonderful God is, how that scientists can predict what's going to happen at the very exact time that's going to be the, the greatest opportunity to see a complete um, Eclipse. And, and so I say today, this is an opportunity for us to have a different kind of worship experience. As we are part of uh, watching for the uh, eclipse, <clears throat> I hope that it'll raise your estimation just a little bit more about the wonderfulness, about the greatness of our God. And so on Monday morning, we'll be able to see that phenomena. It's just a small part of, the, of God's glory. It's supposed to begin about 9.04 a.m. And lasting for about two and a half hours, <clears throat> we'll observe the solar eclipse, God's greatness. So that at some point in time, they say about 10.17 a.m., there will be a total eclipse just north of here in Harrisburg, just a short while, weighs 100%. Eugene, where we live, 99.5%. <clears throat> so we have our special glasses. I hope you have too. 
And we have plans to enjoy watching this as a family. And, and I am amazed at the order of God's creation. It didn't just happen by accident. Every part of God's creation w was planned and thought through from beginning to end. And that's why scientists are able to predict what's going to happen so far as the eclipse is concerned. And I, I, I think it really points to the fact that God is a creator, God, who with preciseness and exactness spoke and the whole universe came into being. And I'm truly amazed. Truly all that is in heaven and in earth is God's. And it is God's kingdom. And he is head over all. And we want to exalt him and praise him at all times. So it was my intention to stay home on Monday and watch it from my backyard. I mean, 99.5% is good enough for me. <clears throat> but there are others in my family who told me that anything less than 100% just would not do. I asked, well, what difference does a half a percent make anyway? And my brother-in-law told me in no uncertain terms that it was the difference between heaven and hell. <laughs> I did not debate the theological implication of that with him. But in honor of my brother-in-law, we plan to be as close to 100% as we watch this phenomena as we can. <clears throat> it reminds me also of Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, where it says, <clears throat> The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day after unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. <clears throat> I believe it was sometime in the spring of the year. I was reading <clears throat> in the paper, the Eugene Register Guard, where it was reported that scientists had just discovered new galaxies and new planets. I thought that all of those things were fixed, but suddenly, because of new scientific equipment, <clears throat> scientists have discovered galaxies beyond what we ever thought of or knew. And there it was in the paper. And as I was thinking about this, Psalm 19 <clears throat> really is not a, 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 in the tense of something that happened in the past, it's in the tense of something that's in the current happening. So when it says <clears throat> the heavens declare the glory of God, that's not something that refers to just the creation of the past. That is referring to right now, today, the heavens are declaring the glory of the Lord. Uh, there is a video from <clears throat> a man by the name of Louis Giglio who has <clears throat> spent quite some time exploring that aspect about how that in outer space there are all these electronic noises that are going on that have been able to be recorded and how that creation seems to be talking <clears throat> even in that outer uh, reaches. And, and so in the process of all of this, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And this eclipse phenomena is a part of the way that the heavens are declaring. God is the God who created all things by the word of his mouth. <clears throat> and he's still active in creation, sustaining his creation. But as I was looking at that article, I wondered, <clears throat> was it just because that they got greater uh, technology, telescopes, that they were able to discover these new galaxies and planets? Or was it that God had, is in the process of still creating, and so suddenly they're able to see these new parts of God's creation. And I wondered about that. I don't know. But it caused me just to think in terms of how wonderful God is, a God of creation, and, and how that by the word of his mouth he spoke and it came into being. It's just another proof of God's greatness and his power. So because of my brother-in-law's encouragement, 
We plan to go for 100% totality. And, and so I got to thinking, because <clears throat> I asked my brother-in-law, well, what difference does 0.5% make? And <clears throat> he tried to explain, well, it, it's just the experience. You just need to be able to experience 100% total accuracy. And as I thought about that, it stimulated in my mind because I had been thinking about what am I going to share with, with you folks this morning? And in my lifetime, there have been a lot of little things that have added up to be very significant things in my life. It may be like that 0.5%, that little bitty small part. And so, and so from that, <clears throat> I came to this time of, of just contemplating those little things that God has caused to happen in my life to where he has brought me where I am today. And it brought to my mind a lot of wonderful memories about people who made significant contributions to my life. Little things perhaps, but little things that added up to a great significance. And I just want to talk about little things this morning. And so I'm going to ramble a few minutes about some of the things that have happened in my life and brought me to where I am. And at the end of the message, I hope that you will be able to see how the small things of your life have added up to create something great and significant and how much that we need God at work in the little things of our lives so that we might be able to bring hope and help and encouragement to others. <clears throat> so here I am. January, I fully retired as being a paid pastor. I still go to the office a couple of days a week because that's who I am and that's what I do. <clears throat> and in the process of that, I've had more time just to sit and to think and to evaluate what I think is important. And through all of this, there have been some significant things that have happened. When I was a senior in high school, our guidance counselors arranged for a day of aptitude testing. It was a fun time. We didn't have to go to classes. We did all these other manual dexterity and other kinds of things. And I had always thought that since I grew up in a farming community in Wisconsin, that I would be like so many other families, that I would be a farmer as well. I'm so glad that I didn't become a farmer. <laughs> Not because I don't like farming, but because the scene in Wisconsin where I grew up changed very, very rapidly away from family farms to where they became hobbies. Farmers had to have another op occupation because they just couldn't make it just by farming. And now you don't see very, very many family farms left. In fact, uh, all, all the dairy farms in Wisconsin are now mostly closed, and there are huge conglomerate dairy farms that are there. And that, that's how farming has taken over. You had to go big or you would die with that. At any rate, that's what I thought I would be doing. But the day after we had that battery of tests, the instructor who administered the test went around to everybody in the class and said, well, you're going to be such and such, and you're going to be such and such. And he looked at me and said, Kenny's going to be a preacher. And within my spirit, I said, no way. I can't do anything like that. It was just a small thing. He made that suggestion. And even though I wasn't ready to understand that or think in terms of that, it came to being. Now, I'm not saying that his suggestion caused that to happen, but it was just a little bitty thing in my life that contributed to where I am today. <clears throat> and so after that, through a series of various events in my life, I did sense God calling me into ministry. In 1965 to 1969, I spent four years at Midwest Bible College preparing for ministry. And I can tell you that there were a lot of little things that got me through those four years. I worked my way through school, sometimes at less than a dollar and a quarter an hour. Um, and in the last year and a half, without me asking anyone for financial aid, God provided two sponsors who provided just enough income so that I could go through college and finish up my degree. And I left college without any great student loans. I had a $200 loan from my grandmother 
And she said, Kenneth, I don't have any retirement income, so I need you to pay this back. And I was glad to do that. And I also received a $500 uh, scholarship, Faithful Servant Memorial Fund scholarship, that I chose to pay back. But I left college um, owing more on my car than I did on my education. Little things along the way reinforced that God's call was upon my life. <clears throat> Another little thing, not so little after all, was being assigned in my, between my junior and senior years at Midwest to go to Conroe, Texas to gain some practical ministerial act, uh, experience before I began my senior year. It was a lot of fun spending that two months there in Texas. I met a lot of good people, a lot of pretty girls, but the prettiest one came, you know, is sitting here with me today. Little things mean a lot. It brought Mary Jean and I together. And I finished my last year at Midwest, <clears throat> and I requested from the licensing committee that I would be allowed to do an internship in Conroe because Mary Jean and I had plans to get married, and we felt like that that would be a wonderful opportunity for us just to stay right there within her church family. And so in June of 1969, I became a pastor, an intern pastor, and an unexperienced husband. <laughs> These were two little things that became great things that contributed greatly to where I am today. And both of those experiences have helped me so much in my life. As an intern, Mary Jean and I were involved for that first year in a lot of youth work throughout the state of Texas. I worked under Elder K.C. Walker, who had a strong emphasis in his ministry on, on Bible prophecy. And, <clears throat> but he gave me freedom to do various youth activities in the state of, of Texas. And we partnered with Ken and Sandy Lawson to organize some state events like uh, winter youth retreats and to gather kids all over from Texas for a rally in, 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 for a weekend, for a Sabbath. It was really a lot of fun. I can remember um, going to Corpus Christi uh, one Sabbath after church, and kids from all over Texas were gathering around. We slept on the beach. We had a, we had a devotional there, and we even you know, went swimming uh, that night in the, in the Gulf, and and how the kids came together, and there was such a strong bond of, of, of relationship that developed there. And it was really, really a lot of fun. Ministry was fun. Additionally, as I worked with Elder Casey Walker, he would go to one of the churches in Houston once a week, on a Wednesday night, I think it was, and shared his prophecy studies with them. And so... It gave me an opportunity then to become acquainted with the Spanish work there in Houston and to develop a relationship with, with some of their families, like Francisco Banda and his family. Um, immediately, there was this special kind of relationship that, that, that began, and, and so plans were made for us to do some things together. He made arrangements for us to go to Mexico for a weekend to do some youth work together. We, I think it was like a six-hour drive to get there, and we left on a Friday and got down there after, you know, way late at night. We got up on Sabbath morning, and it was my first opportunity to preach where I had an interpreter, line by line, speak what I was speaking. And the whole weekend stands out as, as one of those uh, special times because the, the spirit and the presence of God was there in such a mighty way as we developed relationship with people that, um, that it was just, that was one of those special times. It perhaps was just a little thing at the time, but it had a strong bearing upon who I was becoming. Uh, Mary Jean was pregnant with Carla at that time, and so as word got out, <clears throat> Uh, one of the ministers there in, in, in Reynosa, Mexico, had a furniture store, and he insisted that we take a rocking chair home with us. And I had a 1967 Mercury Cougar. Uh, it has very little trunk, if any. Um, and we had other people riding with us in the car. But the Banda family had a station wagon, and somehow they tied that rocking chair to the top of the station wagon, and some of the luggage space that they used up above came 
with us, and uh, stayed with them, but in the process, they had to have us take some people. So we had six people on a little Mercury Cougar. We had bucket seats in front. Mary Jean sat on a pillow uh, on that, between the two um, pil- uh, seats there. And she, she still remembers that. And, and so do I, because she let me know how, that, um, that unco- how uncomfortable that was. Well, it didn't bother me a whole lot, you know, because I was sitting in the driver's seat, and I was... But that rocking chair is still a precious part of our family life today. We rock both of our babies in that rocking chair. It's still just as sturdy as it was when we brought it home. Um, it's a reminder of, of how that as we go along, God is always there with us to aid us in whatever our experiences are. Mary Jean and I honeymooned in, off Padre Island in, next to Corpus Christi. And later in ministry, through the Banda family, we had opportunities to go back as they were trying to plant a church in Corpus Christi. And we met some wonderful families there who had young kids. And I remember the relationship that we developed over time with them. And, 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 you know, I, 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 I wish that I had the energy and strength today that I had back in those days because it didn't seem like, you know, all these long things driving and then coming back and... Well, I'm very little sleep it made much of a difference. But in the process of things, um, these young teenagers said, Ken, what we appreciate about you is your smile. Your smile. It always seems to encourage us. And, 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 and I just responded, well, I'm doing the Lord's work, and it's so much fun. How can I not smile? Since that time, there have been so many other little things that have made a big difference in our lives. One of those was serving as pastor here in Harrisburg. It was so much fun. It really, really was fun. And and there were lots of little things that added up to provide us a great deal of encouragement that helped us develop in, in the area of ministry. And I'll never forget one Sabbath, Vernon Williams came up to me and said, Ken, I need to talk to you. So we went outside, and he said, I've been looking, I've been observing you as you raise your daughters, and you need to let off, I mean, some on your oldest one. You're too tough on her. He called her the big daughter and the young daughter. And Vernon saw something. I appreciate the fact that he saw something and acknowledged it and confronted me about it because, yeah, Carla and I butted heads. We were strong-willed people, and we were always right. He observed that, that, that I was tougher on her than I was on Christy, and he said, you need to give her a break. I'll never forget that, and I want him. It was a little thing at the time, but it meant a great deal to me and probably meant a great deal more to Carla, because he did observe something that was taking place in that relationship, and he came alongside of me to help me understand it and to see it. He got my attention, and adjustments were tough and hard over the years, but through a sequence of various, various things happened, I remembered what Vernon said, and I learned as she grew and as she developed that there were some things that I could say to her to let her know if I was coming on too strong just to tell me, Dad, this is not the right time, and I would know what she was talking about and say, okay. See, as I look back on our lives, Carla and I were a lot alike in our personalities. On the other hand, Christy was a little charmer. Uh, She could say the sweetest things to get me to do what she wanted me to do. <laughs> and it often worked. When I would correct her or give instruction to her, she would just smile at me and use her soft little language and get me to see things. Well, it's perhaps not as bad as what I thought. As a toddler, she was not as wild as what probably Corbin was at that age, but she did a lot of running around and was a bit haphazard and reckless from time to time. There was one time when she was running around and she fell against the fireplace and cut her tongue. She actually 
had a forked tongue. She spoke with forked tongue. And so she had that tendency to go all out and that kind of thing. And one day, you know, I cautioned her, you know, you need to be careful. I would catch her jumping and running on the couch or whatever, and I would come talk to her about that. Well, one day, I came in the living room, and she back and forth, back and forth, just as fast as she could go. And I sat down by her, and I said, I have told you how many times that you could fall, you could hurt yourself. And you remember your, your tongue? And, you, and I don't know how long I went on, but it was far too long for her. <laughs> she reached over, <clears throat> put her arm around me, and said, Hiya, honey. <laughs> Next thing I know, we were both falling on the floor laughing. Because how can you scold? How can you scold your daughter when she's so sweet and kind? <laughs> Little things like that. My children have discipled me. They have taught me so many things. And, and I, I appreciate the fact that there were times when they would get in my face and say, Dad, thus and so. They made me, they forced me to see things from a different perspective. And one of the biggest things I learned was that Dad is not always right. Dads sometimes have faulty information upon. Before I wrap up this rambling, I, I want to mention just one more thing. After we spent <clears throat> our time here in Harrisburg, we were assigned to the Southwest District to be superintendent of, of that district. And, and like I said before, pastoring the church here in Harrisburg was fun. And I remember in the board of directors meeting as they were making placements for district super, superintendents that people kept saying, pointing their finger at me and saying, well, Ken, it's your turn. You need to step up, and you need to be prepared to, to serve as a superintendent. And I said in that meeting, I'm having too much fun. I don't want to have to, I don't want to, have to rise to that level of incompetence. <laughs> but I went. And my heart was still back in Oregon. I learned a lot through, through that experience and, and appreciate district superintendents and what they have to go through today, but it's not something that I was made or called to do. And in the process of that, one of the highlights uh, was Cornerstone had just begun their ministry at that time. And I arranged, since I was district superintendent, for Cornerstone to come to Southwest District, I think, in two different winters. And I would travel with them to the various churches. I set up the concerts. And we were setting up one evening, getting ready for a concert. And one of the brothers in the group came along and sat down beside me. And he looked at me and he said, Ken, um, where's your smile? Where's your smile? We've always noticed that about you. What's going on that you're not smiling anymore? And it was a reminder to me that, that in the course of ministry, sometimes things can happen to the point where you get weighed down by those things and you forget about relationship and you forget about the, the, the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ it is really joyful and that that joy ought to be shown or evident in, in the course of, of reaching out and, and serving. And so it was a reminder to me that joyful service, even in stressful time, is so important. And that even though I may be weighed down by burdens and problems, I need to let the countenance of Jesus Christ shine in and out of my life. A lot of those little things have really contributed to where I am today. And a couple of weeks ago, we have a new family in our congregation, and just before services began, they said, Ken, we want to talk to you. And so I stepped out into the aisle, and they said, well, we don't know exactly how we need to tell you, but we love your smile. You can't, we can't tell you how important, how lifted up, how encouraged we are, how welcomed we feel because you greet us and you have that smile on your face. And I told them, I told them, 
I need to ask you, if you ever see that smile leave my face, would you tell me? Because that's a reminder. Whenever that smile leaves my face, it's a reminder to me that I'm hanging on to something too tightly and not willing to let Jesus Christ be the bearer of that burden. And I think it's the process of those little things in life that have caused me to remember that it's a joy to serve. It's fun to, it, when you're in relationship with the Lord to serve even in the tough times, even in the bad times. <clears throat> so I wind down my rambling this morning. And this is where I'm hoping to lead us in, in, to, in a conclusion. In John, the fourth chapter, verse 35, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and what he said to them was, do not say there are four more months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Look around. There may be people that God has purposely brought to you in your life, and your smile might be the encouraging thing that he would use to encourage them to come alongside and say, I care. It might be any number of different kinds of things, but we need to be looking for those people, those opportunities that God places in our lives and are directly in our path so that we might be able to do just some little thing that we might be an encouragement. I tell you, now, since this couple told me about my smile was there again, it reminds me that everything that I do when I come to church, when I gather with the people, God wants to use me in some little way to be encouragement to others so I don't come just to be able to receive a blessing. I come knowing that God wants me to be the giver of blessings. It changes my outlook on life, and that's why I had to share it with you this morning. But the thing about it is we need to lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes to watch for those opportunities. It may be just a smile. It may be just a kindful thought that, someone would, that, that you would do for someone, a little gift, a prayer. Little things make a difference. Little things can add up to making an eternal difference in the lives of the people that God gives us as we live our lives. And so I end with this thought. When, when, when I began my ministry um, almost 50 years ago, the big emphasis in the church then was on prophecy. We always heard Jesus is coming again. And that message is still true. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming again. We don't know when. I remember when the war broke out in 1967 in the Middle East that my instructors at college said, uh, this has got to be the beginning of Armageddon. But guess what? It wasn't. 1974 war, I heard preachers say the same kind of thing during that time. It never happened. But I want to say this morning that Jesus could return at any time. Brother Sheffield mentioned about perilous times that we live in. We recognize that, um, that the world has so many things. Uh, it, it's so out of balance. It's so chaotic. We can easily get distracted to the point where we forget to look up and see the people around us to offer the hope and the help and the encouragement that other people need. Little things like living in God's grace and his mercy. Little things that could cause us perhaps to change our focus, get it off ourselves and upon others. We need to be people who are ready and prepared to do little things to encourage others along the way. And so I ask you this morning, think about the little things that God has used in your life to bring you to where you are today. The people he's caused to come alongside of you to um, encourage you. I heard about senior youth camp and about how kids were going to kids and talking to them about the relationship with Jesus Christ and 16 of those senior campers were baptized this year. Little things like just, you know, a kid saying, hey, have you thought about that? And then praying with them and then leading them to uh, the adults. Little things 
little things that speak encouragement. So I say, lift up your eyes. See the people around you and how you may love them in the name of Christ. I say, don't just come to church. I say, be the church. Don't just come looking to receive a blessing. Come to be a blessing. Little things mean a lot. Would you bow with me as we pray? And Father in heaven, I just want to rejoice in you this morning because you are a wonderful God, a wonderful creator. And in Jesus Christ, you have loved us all. You have sent him that we might be able to find a redeemer, a savior, a deliverer. And Lord, not only do you just call us to follow you, to accept you and to walk with you, but, but you call us to serve you. And, and Lord, you're a wonderful God because you provide people and experiences in our lives at just the right times so that we might be the people that you really want us to be. I just want to say thank you for the Harrisburg congregation. Lord, for the difference that they have made in my life. And I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over this congregation, over its pastor and over its leaders, Lord, that you would just continue to work in their hearts and their lives, that this congregation might be a beacon that shines light outward into the community. And Lord, that they will do the little things that reach and touch the hearts of many for the glory of God. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help each of us to lift up our eyes. Lord, that you would help us to see your place upon us in our lives. And Lord, how you would use us, perhaps just in giving a smile, perhaps just in whatever it might be. But Lord, help us to realize that we're here for your purpose. And as we lift up our eyes, we can love people the way that you love us. Help us to do that in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.